It's a pleasure to welcome Thomas Woltz of Nelson Bird Woltz Landscape Architects at Charlottesville, Virginia. It's been a tremendous honor over the past two and a half years to be entrusted with uh, a new vision for the future of this incredibly important landscape for the people of Houston. Like many of us, we were inspired by Comey's plan and the very large nugget Memorial Park represents within that landscape. And Jeff Ayton, my senior associate who has so capably led this project over the past two and a half years with about eight people from our office, six of whom are sitting right there. I think there was a mixed reception. The people of Houston, many of the 3,300 who came to our public meetings, um, asked themselves why had someone from New York or Virginia, they couldn't figure out which, I couldn't either, um, <laughs> why did someone from so far away need to come here to tell them what their wilderness park needed to be? And I would say we were not brought here um, to bring a style or object making that we might have been recognized for somewhere else. We were invited here because of the way we think and the process that we were going to bring to this important landscape. And our process at Nelson Bird Waltz has evolved from my mentorship with Warren Bird through my mentorship with a staff of 42. To look deeply at the ecology of a place, commensurate with the culture of a place, and start to weave the narratives out of that discovery period that belong only to that place in the world. One of the greatest influences of that process has been my participation in the Board of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. Um, early days, I, in a wonderful meeting with uh, then Mayor Anise Parker, um, I said, you know, what if Houston is seen by the nation as the city of parks? And um, she was so supportive of our work here and of that vision, and here we are several years later, and thank you, Charles, for hosting this wonderful event. So to the process, it was one year of public meetings. I mentioned 3,300 people attended those meetings. We listened. You can't say yes to everyone, and that was a hard lesson. I made it through those meetings without ever revealing, as Mary Margaret uh, made her true confession this morning, that my great-great-grandfather was the mayor of Waco and in the House of Representatives of Texas in the 1850s. And I, I made it all the way through the public process without pulling out my Texas card. But um, <laughs> why we were hired um, and how we were hired is actually an incredibly interesting part of the story. Visionary. Um, the, and I'll get part of this wrong. Many of you know this better than I do. I have no business telling it. But my quick Reader's Digest version is that the Uptown Turs district was uh, in meetings with Mayor Parker. The district boundary was redrawn so that the Uptown Turs could invest in improvements for this park that was not located inside of any Turs. The Memorial Park Conservancy formed to raise private dollars, and Houston Parks and Recreation were at the table in a three-part client that we've reported to now for two and a half years. That has been an extraordinary three-legged stool, and three-legged stools don't fall over. They don't wobble, they're strong, and this group has helped each other in a really beautiful way because they all care about this park so deeply. And that's Joe and John Breeding and Sarah and Shelley Arnold, and I don't have any notes, but I have 40 people on this piece of paper because I'm so scared I'm gonna forget somebody. Um, so this was the way the park was before the drought. So look closely, and then sadly, this was what happened. So for those of you who don't know Houston, 70% of the trees in Memorial Park died. The park is twice the size of Central Park, at just under 1,500 acres. This is a colossal piece of land. Many Houstonians said, give us back our wilderness park. That's what we want. We just want it back the way it was. That's much easier said than done. And because of the, the process we go through, we wanted to dig deeply to find out what was it. And what was it prior to the memory of the Houstonians who were asking for it to be put back? Who had been here? Why? What were the settlement patterns? What were the different cultural forces that shaped this landscape? And what were the ecological forces that shaped this landscape? This led to a team of over 70 advisors of ecology, archaeology. Um, we partnered with Sherwood Design Engineering because they really understand the art of sustainable stormwater management. And Susan Turner, who's a landscape architectural historian and landscape architect in her own right and fellow board member at TCLF. With this team, Berg Oliver, uh, uh, conservation biologist, with this team, we started to gather all the data and information. And what we did in the public meetings was report out to the Houstonians a portrait of their city, 
a portrait of their park. And people started to realize there were richer stories of who this city was embedded in this landscape that many people either didn't know or had forgotten. This was an analysis to try to accommodate all the pieces of the program, an analysis to look for the most disturbed areas. If in fact this was to be a wilderness park, as I think um, Hogg had envisioned, as the hair and hair plan that was subsequent to that and was in current lore, we needed to understand where the impacts had been, locate new amenities in the most highly impacted and disturbed land, and connect to the extent possible the conservation land, all while keeping in mind the greater connectivity of things we saw on the horizon thanks to conversations with Guy Hackstad and Nancy Kender and Tom Bacon about how this would connect to the greater city of Houston. Immediately, day one, the question of connectivity to the rest of the city was on the table out of scope, but on the table. <laughs> so these are the disturbed areas in pink. You're seeing uh, 1914 to 1918 Camp Logan, the post-Camp Logan era, Werner Realty uh, and the first park being built. You're seeing a catalog too vast to go through of all the layers for people who thought this was the last fragment of undisturbed Texas forest. We said, actually, it's more interesting than that. You had all this incredible stuff that happened here. Similarly, parks, and this is our national tragedy, have been considered empty or open space. They've been the dumping ground of infrastructure, and Texas, the, this city of Houston, thanks to um, I, I'm a Hogg's leadership, said no to so many of the megastructures that were proposed to be dumped here. That did not, however, prevent the cutting of 610, I-10, the rail already existed, but then a six lane, I call it a highway of Memorial Parkway going right through, uh, Memorial Drive going right through the middle of the park, bisecting the park effectively. I mean, it is really playing Frogger with your life to cross <laughs> that road. <laughs> One of our main goals was to bridge these areas that have been subdivided by roads. There were miles and miles of road within this park. Where had the human experience gone? Also, it didn't start with I'm a hog. It started long before. For probably a thousand years, the Karankawa Indians were on this land, many different Indian tribes. This is a map of the different languages of the Native American tribes that occupied this land. And I love it when culture and ecology interbraid. During our research and through test pits, deep test pits, found regular intervals of ash, revealing that this had been a fire-managed landscape by the Native Americans for hundreds of years before the Reinermans bought it, farmed it as an orchard. Uh, later as grazing land, and then even after that as a logging operation. So all of these layers of settlement patterns of Native Americans of managed landscape preclude the sort of era of significance as we might uh, categorize it in today's terms. This is the paucity of the vegetation composition. In some ways the drought, the six year drought, as tragic as it was, it allowed us to reset the ecology of the entire park, yielding the map on the right which is through soil analysis, seed bank analysis, and hydrology to understand what are the authentic, resilient Texas ecologies that belong in this landscape. You're seeing riparian forest along Buffalo Bayou to the south. You're seeing the pine hardwood forest and then pine hardwood savanna in the lighter green and then in beige native prairie. This was looking at the entire scale of the park to start to develop a lexicon and a vocabulary of ecologies appropriate to their place on the land. Why? Because flood will come again, as Fritz pointed out. Drought will come again. If we're going to invest in repairing the park, we must invest in the most naturally resilient ecologies possible. This is building on the amazing work of Reed Hildebrand and uh, Design Workshop, who are about a year and a half ahead of us, starting on the Texas Arboretum and Nature Center in the lower left. So we're blending their wonderful colleagues, and so we've <laughs> blended their research and approach at Texas Arboretum and Nature Center into ours. So what if you could stand in the Arboretum and Nature Center and look out across a vast prairie, you know, and you feel that stitching? This is all Memorial Park. One part is an Arboretum, one part is a Memorial Grove, one part different things. So give us the opportunity to build on their excellent research and expand their research to the scale of the park, but also be, uh, start working closely with them. 
this is the resulting master plan, and I'm gonna walk you through a series of projects moving in a counterclockwise direction, starting with the running track at the running center. This is the living bridge. You'll see at the very end a proposed land bridge, 1,800 feet of an arcing land bridge that will for the first time stitch the southern and northern halves of the park. You're seeing restored savanna and prairie, 38 miles of biking, hiking, horseback trails added to the park. You're also going to see a one mile long arcing boardwalk, absolutely level, ADA accessible, so that people in a wheelchair for the first time can see the banks of the bayou and can read with their body the subtle and exciting topography of the barrancos, the drainage ways within the park, as they cross from prairie to riparian forest. To the right, you'll see the, the eastern glade. To the north, a sports park to replace all of the existing fields but move them to the north so they can share grooming equipment, concessions, bathrooms, all the things required uh, for those. And then I'll finish with the Memorial Groves, which is really an homage to the very important history and why it's called Memorial Park, which was it was the site of Camp Logan, the World War I training camp for soldiers trained in Houston who went to serve for our freedom in Europe. This is uh, the image of the timing track behind the running trail center. You're seeing a wet prairie, post oak savanna, looking down to the bayou. This is an unusual one in that this will manage stormwater inside the running track. It's not a college track and field, so we don't have shock put and all those things in the middle. We can just run. This is what we call the southern arc, and you're seeing all the bike and birding trails. This is really a kind of reflective part of the park. We've removed the ball fields, the parking lots, and the light structures to the northern part of the park to restitch the ecology at an enormous scale across the entire southern part of the park. At each terminus, there's an overlook to see down the remarkable views of the bayou, as people have referred, the only non-concreted river in Houston. An incredible amenity to have in the city and as our southern neighbor in the park. This is a rendering uh, by our rendering company Mir in Scandinavia. This is one overlook. And if you follow with your eye, you're crossing each of the drainage ways in the ecologies. I never get tired of walking in an arc because <laughs> you never can see the end. And it's exactly one mile, which I discovered people in Houston love exact measurements. <laughs> it has pissed off so many people that Seymour Lieberman is 2.87 miles. <laughs> so I'm happy to announce we've got it to three miles. So <laughs> I think that's the thing of Master Play that made people the happiest. <laughs> This is uh, the Hair and Hair Plan, a plan that was like so many parks in America, designed in the 1920s. The Great Depression happened, a little momentum started again, and then World War II happened, and then the sort of divestment in parks of the 50s and 60s in so many states. So it resulted sort of by accident in a wilderness park, which we came to understand was mostly invasive exotics. I'll bring your attention to this gesture here that was a formal gesture from Arnott coming in and it was a circular area and it just says garden written on it. So I should say in our cultural research, we have no intention to recreate any moment in time. We're not gonna recreate the hair and hair garden. We're not recreating Camp Logan. We are making a contemporary 21st century park, but that is deeply infused by the things that came before. To have an authentic 21st century response is our aspiration to these traces of history. So this is uh, from the boards, a sketch looking at the existing, the remaining mots of trees, a proposed stormwater, a lake that will supply irrigation for this large green. It's for passive recreation to really spend time under the high canopy, but also, again, in this layering to acknowledge that that is Blossom. There was a gate, it's just a pedestrian entry, but there was a wooden gate here that was the welcome gate to Camp Logan. So in this way, this layer, you have a large green and you have the um, trace of Camp Logan. Here's the rendering of what the Eastern Glade will look like. Um, you see the large meadow with pine trees for light shade, the lake and a pavilion looking back across the lake. The athletic fields to the north, an aerial showing uh, what those athletic fields will look like, and you can see downtown in the distance. And then I'm ending with Camp Logan. This has been an exciting part of this process. I should mention that the Eastern Loop Road, uh, we moved to accommodate the Eastern Glades. That's under construction. The final CDs are being done. We're partnering with Lauren Griffith uh, in, in Houston on that with the planting plans and construction documents and Walter P. Moore. 
Uh, the Eastern Glade is in design development, and this portion is just wrapping up concept design. So we're, we have a lot of momentum in Memorial Park to start with these exciting phase one projects. This was a, an image of the remount station in Camp Logan. This is a layering of the map of Camp Logan, and at the level of a master plan, you want to go deep in archaeology, you want to go deep in everything, but you have limited time. So our archaeological consultants revealed interesting ruins and remnants of latrines and shower buildings in the western part of the park near the Eureka Rail Line, and that these were the old subdivisions of the different regiments where the camp was. These are the quality of the ruins, the remnants of Camp Logan. And then came this idea of a living memorial to the soldiers' sacrifice. The photographs of the soldiers at Camp Logan amidst the pines, and then this remarkable image of a forest in snow and the equally spaced trees. Struck me one day, we were drawing in the office together on this project, as what if a planting of pines not only acknowledges the timber era of the park, the agricultural era of the park, but it also represents the soldiers standing in formation in each of the different regiments that um, were trained and then went off, and so many who died, and so many were awarded great medals of honor. So this image struck me as an interesting evocation as a memorial to those soldiers in the area where they lived. This is a plan of the location of the tents and these ruined buildings here. So to use that as our inspiration for the planting distance, and then into that to carve open spaces for picnicking and gathering and remembrance. Currently, there's really not much to tell you that why Memorial Park is Memorial Park, and many of the citizens at our public meetings didn't actually know. So this is the plan as it's developing in concept. You can see these clearings everywhere. There are healthy mots of oaks and pines we're keeping, of course, and then interplanting with this extensive grid, 90 acres, of grid of pines as a living landscape memorial. This is the most recent rendering, the Eureka line, and you can see the clearings and this endless sort of reminder of how many thousands of people were trained here. One of the concept ideas of this park was that after 25 years of growth, a select um, regiment would be felled. 25 years is the average age of the soldiers who died trained at Camp Logan in World War I. Those trees could be cured and go to Habitat for Humanity to build something in service to a need in Houston. On Armistice Day, the citizens of Houston could replant a thousand trees and build that memorial for the next generation. It's a big ask to cut down a tree in a park, but this is an idea that we've put out there. Um, I think I have to leave it to the next generation to decide whether they will be removed or not. But this is the idea of memorial, and this is the rendering inside the memorial with a careful interpretation of any of the ruins, a docent leading a tour for kids to build that emotional relationship between place, their city, and their own history. If we can build that emotional relationship, we are building the next generation of stewards. This is a park so full of stories, I've told you only a couple. It's a powerful place, and I feel like our greatest hope is to bring an identity to each of these different areas of the park. The last image I'll show you is of the land bridges because I find it's very symbolic to link ecologies, culture, and to bridge over this highway. There's a simultaneity here that is the hybrid of the 21st century. We have transportation needs, but we also can, in another way, celebrate this bridging of the southern and northern halves of the park and find our place within the city. Thank you so much.